Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants here, and welcome to episode 97 of Secret Source, the restaurant marketing podcast. 17 tips to help you get better photos for your restaurant. Part two. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret source. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success, your secret sauce. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So, I did lie in the previous podcast. I apologize profusely. I did fully intend to start getting through into our 17 tips on how to take great photos, but I yabbered on too much. I think we covered some important ground, though. I will get well and truly into the 17 tips that we've got because I don't have anything else to talk about. I'm going to get straight onto it. After I mention one quick thing, thank you so much for everyone who's hit me up on LinkedIn. Big milestone this week for me was that I hit 10,000 connections in LinkedIn, which, you know, hey, I think is actually pretty cool. And a couple of people said, well, you know, congratulations, that's exciting. And I pointed out, it's not the fact that... I've got 10,000 connections. It's the people that I'm connecting with on LinkedIn every day who are either helping me at Marketing for Restaurants or I'm able to help them in their restaurant. You know, people are coming up with podcast topics. They're asking marketing questions. We're getting customers who are putting in support requests or ideas for new... In fact, people who aren't customers are saying, you know, I'd love to use the free online restaurant booking system, but I need it to be able to do this. If you could put that in, that would be epic. All sorts of conversations. I'm spending more and more of my time in LinkedIn, and I'm actually going to do a podcast specifically on should you be on LinkedIn? Spoiler alert, yes, you probably should be. Just because of the fact that I'm seeing, and there's a hot for a restaurant, like obviously our businesses are very different. I run a restaurant marketing company you run a restaurant, there are people in LinkedIn who you will be able to impact for a whole range of reasons. And that's what I'd like to cover off on in the next episode of the Secret Source podcast. But before we get there, let's get into the 17 tips to how to take great photos for your restaurant. So the first one is spend a little bit of time on it. You know, now, we get photos. We get photos all the time. This is our stock and trade. We're getting photos, you know, whether we're building a website, whether we're doing a social media campaign or doing brochures, whatever it is, we're getting photos from restaurants. And it is clear, it is clear that someone has not taken any time in getting that photo. Or if they have, they've spent time on how to take a really crappy photo because it certainly hasn't paid off. So you've got to think about what the intent is. It's not, oh, you know, I've got to quickly grab a photo of this dish before it goes over the pass. It's, I'm taking a photo because this is our signature dish and I want 10,000 people to see this image and I want them to go, wow, I want them to be as excited about my signature dish as I am. If you stop and think about that, if you say that before you do it and people are going, oh, wow, Joe, that's a big number, 10,000. Well, here's the thing. Your website should get 10,000 people in a year should. It should get more, right? So, if you put that on the front page, then 10,000 people will see that image. If you're not getting 10,000 people into your restaurant, then maybe there's a problem with the image that's on the front page of your website. There are people who run Facebook campaigns that are seen by 10,000 people. You could do a video that is seen by 10,000 people and you may only have to spend $20 to get it if it's an epic video. So, 10,000 is not a large number by any stretch of the imagination, Imagine if you had 10 great looking dishes and put them up on Facebook and they were each seen by the same 10,000 people. Your brand recognition, the, you know, top of mind recall of your restaurant would really be pretty high. So number one, take a little bit of time. Now, next one, lighting. Lighting is your friend, okay? So when the more light there is, the sharper the image will be. So, and remember, There'll be some photography people who are going to say, oh, you know, what James has said is wrong. I'm talking about, I just want you to be able to take a better photo with your compact or your your phone. So there's lots of ways that you can play with light. And I highly recommend that you, you know, you try and learn all about them. But 
for quick and dirty photos where you've obviously spent more than 30 seconds thinking about it, bright light is a really good thing. Poor light is generally makes for poor images. One of the things that I find really interesting is I, I spoke to a restaurant owner once and he said, I've dimmed the lights in the restaurant because I'm sick and tired of people taking photos of my food. I spend so much effort in creating the food, then they take this crappy photo. And it was like, dude, why don't you actually help them to take a photo, right? You've put all of this effort in. Like, if they think your food is photo worthy, then you should try and help them, you know? And I've seen places where they'll actually have spotlights on the table so that it's really simple to take that photo. Or I've even seen people bring a light around so that, you know, would you like a little bit of extra light? There's plenty of ways that you can deal with it. Most people have got good light under the pass. It's, it's quite warm. It's not a stark white light. That can be really good. But you want to be thinking about the light. Sunlight is great as well when you can get the sunlight. That does lead into our third tip, which is shadow. Now, shadow helps to show texture. So if you've got something that's got some really good texture in it, you might do a really big close-up of it and make it so that the light is sort of coming in from an angle so that you can really see those shadows. Have a think about where the sun is or the light source and get the shadow to sort of play. Get it to show the height, get it to show the texture of the food or whatever it is that you're taking the picture of. Now, the next one's pretty obvious, but we see this mistake being made fairly often, and that is, can you please clean the lens? Now, especially on a mobile, you'll have had that in your pocket, you'll have it up to your ear, you'll be doing all sorts of crazy things with your phone, and far too often, it's all messy, and you can see, you can see that, you know, there's no big, huge streaks on it, but you can see that the image is quite blurry in some parts and not in others, and you think, you know what, that's got to be some sort of smear on the lens. So that can make a big difference, so please make sure that your lens is moderately clean. And you know what, like, you're not meant to, but I just clean it with a t-shirt. You know, the t-shirt I've got on, just a quick wipe, just to make sure. And, you know, it's really interesting, my Samsung S9, it will say, "Mm, cleaning your lens might make it take a better photo. So it'll sometimes pick up the fact that there is junk on the lens. Now, the next one sort of follows on from our talk about how much light you need. The lower the light, the more stable you're going to need your phone to be. So if, you know, you are operating in a low light environment, then you might need to use, you either rest your hand on the table, you get a little one of those tripods. I've got a couple of tripods sitting around because of, you know, various situations where I'd need a tripod and low light is definitely one of those. Or it might be one of those situations where you just try really hard to keep the phone still. Too often people have been moving the camera around too much for the amount of light that's coming in because what happens is the camera whether it's old school film any sort of digital camera it's going to look at how much light is coming in and it's got a sensor and that sensor needs to get a certain amount of light to be able to take a photo this comes into sort of time-lapse photography you know you might take a, a photo over five seconds at night and the image might look almost like broad daylight because it's picking up on the small amounts of light that are coming through. Now, obviously, when you're doing that, it's got to be rock solid because it's collecting light for five seconds. Now, that's an extreme example. And we've taken some nice, you know, you go out to a campsite and, and people are cooking on a, on, a, on a big open fire. And so you might take an exposure of, you know, three or four seconds just because you want to, you know, there's not a lot of light there. But if it's low light or not great light, then you're going to want to hold your camera as still as possible. Otherwise, you're going to get the blurs. And that is often they'll rule the image out. It's just a garbage image and you want to delete it straight off. But it'll also take away some of that crispness that you want. And particularly with food photos, I think a lot of the time crispness is really, really good. If you're taking photos of people and they're elderly people and they don't want to see all of the wrinkles, then you know what, a little blurring, they call it the Vaseline effect, you know, smear some Vaseline on the lens, that's you know, that's entirely acceptable. But for food, sharper is generally better. Now, next one talks to the kind of uh, what it is that you're trying to do with composition. So we will see sometimes people will be putting, you look at the image and it's it's well lit, it's nice and stable, it's nice and sharp, but it just doesn't look quite right. And there's a rule of thumb that you can use that's going to really help you out. And that's called the rule of thirds. Now, 
most cameras, we got a new DGI for taking some um, interesting photos that we've been uh, looking at, some time-lapse videos of people's restaurants and things like that. It's got a really cool dolly zoom. On the DGI, you know, it's a drone, it will actually, it's actually got rule of thirds that you can put in. So in the setup, you can say, do I want to see the rule of thirds? And so these little white lines come in. And what you want to do is images will generally look better if the horizontal and vertical lines are sort of encapsulated within that. You want to think about that the principle behind the rule of thirds is to imagine breaking an image down into horizontal and vertical thirds. So you're going to have nine parts to the image. So in that where you've got the intersection between the two lines that you've got vertically and two lines horizontally, that gives you important points where you can put items of interest in the photo. And it also gives you those two lines, the two vertical lines and the two horizontal lines. So if you've got cutlery, you might align those on the rule of thirds. If you've got an item there, you might sort of, rather than having the the center of the dish dead center in the photo, you may encompass everything in that middle third, or you may have it off to one side. Now, the big thing with this, this is a, a generic rule that everyone gets taught. Rules are meant to be broken, and so you can play around with it, but have a think about how the image looks. And what I'll do, because I, I find it really difficult to have a look at a photo and think, yep, that's the one. I'll mess around with it. I'll change some settings. I'll take three or four photos. And it's only when I'm looking at it on my big desktop monitor, I go, yep, that's the one. And you'll take three photos. And on your phone, you're like, yep, there's three photos. They're exactly the same. Have a look at them on your monitor. Boom, big difference. So that goes with composition. It also goes with your general picture taking as well. Have a look at it on your monitor. But have a think about how you're going to lay out the photo as far as the rule of thirds go. Now, the next one I think is really important, and that is to be on the lookout. If you've got your phone in your pocket, then you've got your camera in your pocket. Be on the lookout for things that you can take photos of. So it might be that group. It might be the delivery of some fresh food. It might be a customer's face. You know, it might be that it, you've got to look for those kind of things that you can, you know, is it a, have you got a, a sharing table and you've got people all along one side of the sharing table and you've got some really interesting faces in it? you know, that could make a really interesting shot. I was in uh, Taiwan doing some research with some restaurants and I I visited a a monastery and there was monks at a table and I stood off to one side. So I was was looking almost straight down the line, just almost but not quite. And three seats in, there was a gap and then there was a monk behind that and his face sort of stood out. I took a photo, his face was sharp because that was where the depth of field was that was what was in focus everyone else was sort of a little bit blurry and it, you know it's one of the best photos I've ever taken just really you know, it's not food related but I was walking by and I saw that and I thought that's going to make an epic photo and so I fiddled around I spent about you know probably 90 seconds there taking a whole heap of photos one of them was really really nice so you want to be on the lookout for wherever it is and it might be One of the things I think is, you know, you've got strong sunlight coming in and it might be, you know, coming in through curtains, it might be coming in through the window, but there's shadow and light. You know, how does that play off the wine glass? Is the wine glass full? How does it play off the cutlery? How does it, how does that shadow, that that bit between light and dark, how are all of those things going to look? Because if you want that picture of the table set up, that could be the perfect opportunity for it. Now, next one, learn how to use your phone or your camera phone, have a bit of a play with it. What do all of the buttons do? How do you change those modes? And I think that this is really important for a couple of reasons. First off, if you're taking photos of your customers or you've got a fleeting opportunity to take a photo, you don't want to be going, oh, hang on a sec, hang on, hang on. Oh, what do I do here? Oh, hang- how do I turn the flash on? I'm not sure about this. Oh, damn it, it's in the wrong mode. How do I get out of that mode? You want to be very businesslike, very professional. You don't want to be that guy who is takes four minutes to take a photo. Know how to use your photo. Know all of the capabilities. What are the filters? What are the modes? What are the settings that you can change? What happens when you change those settings? doesn't take long. I think it's time well spent to really get a good understanding of how your camera works. Next one on for that, learn the advanced techniques. So... One of the rules is that you should always shoot with the sun over your shoulder. So when it's behind you 
it means that the subject that you're taking the photo of is going to be well lit up. Now, some of the best photos I've ever taken is where I've disobeyed that rule. I'll take a photo of someone and the sun will be above them. Now, your camera, and particularly mobile phone cameras, because they don't deal with that situation very well, you might end up with a silhouette, which is great if you're going for a silhouette. But what I like to do is to use fill-in flash. So you'll actually take a flash photo of someone's face. Now, normally, it would be almost completely dark or very, very dark. With you, You've got the fill-in flash, so that makes it nice and bright, and then you've got a nice bright sun behind the person. That can produce an amazing photo. So that's a pretty easy trick to master. And it's interesting because people go, oh, wow, that photo is amazing. It's like, well, it's not really amazing. It's a cool little trick that I picked up. There's lots of those out there. So learn some of the advanced techniques that you can use. Now, on a mobile, don't use Zoom, okay? Just don't use Zoom. That Zoom, and I see it happen all the time. People go and, you know, they'll have their iPhone out and then they're like zooming in for something that's um, a couple of meters away. Now, all Zoom does is it takes an image and it blows it up and it blows it up and it blows it up again. So that image is actually getting grainier and grainier and grainier as you do it. So there's two things that you can do. One, just take the photo and then maybe crop for the bit that you need in software or get a little bit closer. Don't use the zoom. It's not really very good at all. Next one, have a think about the angle that you're going to take. And Tina always thinks it's really funny. When we're out at dinner, I'll take a photo where I'll be looking straight down on the plate and then I might go really, really, really low. So I'm looking across the plate. And I think not too many people use the across the plate view. They're always sort of like looking down on the plate. My thing is that that shot often takes up, you know, your cutlery, you've got the salt and pepper shakers, you've got all sorts of things in the background. What you can do is you can take a photo really close up of a steak. You get that side view of it. You get the mountain of mashed potato next to it. And everything in the background is really blurry. And that means that the eye is drawn to the steak. There's only one thing in that photo, and that's the nice, juicy steak. Everything else is all blurry. So your eye is drawn to that steak naturally. So have a bit of a play around with perspective. It can make a big difference. Now, framing is the next thing. And I see this all the time. So people will take an image, they'll, they'll go for that shot down on top of the plate and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that, that, you know, that can work really well, but then they haven't framed it very well. So there'll be all sorts of, all sorts of junk in the way of it. There's no clear way to crop it. So when you're taking that photo, have a think about what you're going to frame it with. And, you know, if you're taking a photo of people, you might use a wooden beam in the restaurant to be part of the frame. You know, that might be the left-hand side of it, might be a column. That's going to sort of like wall people off and it draws people into the area of activity. Following on from that, make sure you've got a clean background. You know, either, either use that perspective trick that we were talking about to throw everything in the background out or try and clean it up. I'll spend a lot of time, you know, moving stuff around and I'll have cleared half of the table And I just want the food in it. I don't want anything else. So it's going to be a nice, clean photo with a nice, clean background. That way, people aren't confused about what it is that we're looking at. It's, hey, look at the food. The food's epic. Next thing, you know, have a think about black and white. Have a think about sepia. Have a look at some of the filters or the modes that are available on your camera. One of the things that you can use on... so. I've got a digital SLR, as I mentioned in the last podcast. Well, actually, I think it was two podcasts ago now. And it had a really cool mode where it would do everything in black and white except for one color. So it had a little wheel on it. You could select this mode and then it would show you everything that was green. So if you wanted to take a photo of lush fields and you had some people in it, you could take that photo and they were in black and white, but the field was in green. Or if, you know, if there was a bowl of tomato soup on the table, you could take that photo and the bowl of tomato soup was red, everything else was black and white. You know, and there might be a couple of other bits and pieces that were red. They're easy to, in post-processing, you know, in, in an app, just to turn them to black and white. Very, very effective to make things really stand out. Now, next thing, not so much a tip in regard to photography, but One of the things I find is that people will take a photo and then they'll put it up on Facebook and then that's it. And I think, wow, that's really quite sad. There are some people who take 
absolutely amazing photos that really, really do tell a really powerful story, use them in print, use them on your menus, use them on the walls. You can get them blown up. You can create a book. So it's very, very simple now that if you could do a book for one off, you might take 20 or 30 photos of your menu. And if you wanted to, like for instance, if you were going around doing corporate selling, you could create that that book, get it printed out once. It's going to look amazing. It's an incredibly simple process to get that done these days. You know, technology changes everything. This is one of those things. You shouldn't just be putting the images up on Facebook. There's lots more places that you can be using your photos. Next one, I've kind of alluded to it, post-processing. So have a think about, work out what app you, it is that you're going to use. So I'll, I'll predominantly use MS Paint because I'm old-fashioned and not very good with Photoshop. That's what we've got designers for. That's what we've got Rod for. God bless him. I'll say, can you do this, that, and the other thing? Sharpen this up, do those things. Word has got a, a good little photo editor in there as well. You can play around with color. I'll generally just play around with color. I also use Canva from now every now and then, if particularly if I want to put text in there as well. But learn how to play around with it. You know, definitely cropping, definitely playing with contrast and brightness. You can make an image look a whole lot punchier with just, you know, five or ten seconds worth of processing. And if you do, if you are going to go down the, you know, the Photoshop route, then you can get some really amazing photos. So definitely learn how to edit the photos because I think this makes a big difference. You know, learn how to edit and then learn how to really edit. If you don't have the time to do that, if you don't have the the creative ability, you know, that's what Fiverr's for. We use those features for some of our um, restaurant marketing customers, you know, that we'll, we'll do the design work because we'll get one of our designers to play around with that. But if you're not going to do that, then definitely have a look at some of the editing options out there because there is a lot of things out there. Next tip, take a lot of photos. I never take one photo of a dish because if it's not right, if I've moved my hand and it's a bit blurry... If there's something in the background that's not right, if I'm not happy with the composition, if I'm not happy with the layout, that's it, you know, and by the time I've looked at it, by the time I've worked it out, I've eaten the dish and it's all too late. So, you know, take 10 shots, have a bit of a fly around. And and this is how one of the things I've discovered is the kind of shots that work well is because I've, you know, I've just, oh, I wonder if it looked like if I took a photo like this, what would happen if I did that? How can I move this around? How can I play around with it? So make sure that you're taking more than one shot. Take, you know, and I will, I will literally, I'm a very annoying person to have dinner with, very annoying, because I will take 10 shots of one dish. And my God, imagine the horror of having a degustation menu with me. You know, it takes forever because I'm, oh, wow, this looks really great. Let's take 10 photos of that. You know, and the dish is coming out every 10 minutes and I'm just adding an extra two or three minutes to each course. I'm very annoying. But There is such a big difference between your best photo and your worst photo. And, you know, I will, mine are definitely, definitely, it's not a normal bell curve. Mine are definitely all the way down the horrible end. And there'll be one or two that really stand out. And you think, I'm glad I I spent the time and effort in trying to make these right. Now, the next point I want to talk about is really try and unleash your creativity, If you're doing a good job in the kitchen, then you should be unleashing your creativity. If you're doing a good job in front of house, then there's probably a fair amount of creativity there too. Try and tap into that creativity because, you know, some of the time on Instagram, it's the great menu item that goes viral, but sometimes you will see it being the beautiful photo of the okay menu item that really gets the traction. It's the creativity that you bring to the photography process that's really going to make the difference just as it is the creativity that you bring to the kitchen. So have a play around, you know, try and go over these things, you know, do a bit of research on the internet, maybe sign up for a course. There's plenty of things that you can do to learn to be a better photographer, but really, really unleash the creativity as you do with everything else in your life. And, you know, we've spoken about innovation and creativity. I'm not a photographer, but I love photography. Because it's one of those things that I'm out there, I'm capturing memories, I'm capturing photos. And you know, so many of our photos, they're just private photos that weren't going to show to anyone. It's, you know, a trip, it's a holiday. But so for instance, and this is the perfect example, I was looking for a photo for some artwork for a podcast last week and it was like, oh, what's in this directory? 
And it was a photo of one of our kids when they were probably four years old. So it was probably about eight years old. And you know what? I just slacked it to Tina because I'm Slack. She sits right next to me. Rather than interrupt her and say, come over here, just send it to her on Slack. But everyone had that little la, la, la moment. This is the power of photography. And this is why I want you to unleash your creativity because taking great photos can make a really big difference in the message that you're selling. Lastly, have a think about everything that we've talked about today. But the one thing that you've got to do is take the damn photo, okay? Seriously, take the damn photo. Too many people don't take the photo. And you know what? If it's not perfect, that's not going to kill it. This can be a bit of an issue. Sometimes the photo will be so perfect that it looks like a stock photo. And unless you're in the photo or it's clearly your restaurant, if it's just a food photo and it looks too good, I'll say, is that your food? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's our food. And it's like, oh, it looks like a stock photo. Like it looks too perfect. So don't let perfection be the enemy of a good photo. A good photo is much, much, much better than just an, the photo that hasn't been taken. And we see this all the time. It's the bane of our existence. The website's ready to go. The marketing campaign's ready to go. We just need that picture of the souffle. Oh, yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. I'll I'll get that for you this week. It's like, so this is the third week that we've been waiting for it. And we're expecting 10,000 people to see this image. But you know what? At the rate we're going, no one is going to see that image. No one is going to respond to the Facebook campaign because we're not going to put the website live. We're not going to do the Facebook post. We're not going to run that marketing campaign. We're not going to target that demographic because you haven't taken the damn photo. So get in there. You know, every photo you take, if you sit down and think about it and and read about photography, learn about it, then you're going to be a better photographer. But if you're not taking photos, you're not on that road to being a better photographer. And as I've said, it's such a powerful mechanism for telling that story. A picture really is worth a thousand words. A great picture is worth well in excess of a thousand words because people are going to see it and it's going to reach out to them. It's going to make them hungry. It's going to make them feel loved. It's going to make them feel warm. It's going to make them feel excited. Whatever the emotion is that you're trying to get across, it's very, very hard to get people to feel that emotion through text because you've got to get them to read it and people spend so little time now. So that photo, people can look at it and go, you know what, that reminds me of my mum. And you've immediately made that connection. They'll then probably read the text around it because they're in a nice place. They're in a warm place. They're in a happy place. That text alone would never have done that. So get out there, take a photo, send us some photos, post them up on Facebook, send them through to me. I'd love to see them. Really big advocate for the fact that you guys can take your own photos now. I think that that's really powerful. So there you have it. We covered off on 17 tips. You know what? There's actually more than 17. And people often ask, why is it that you'll say, you know, eight great tips to do this and then there's nine? Because we always like to under-promise and over-deliver. We don't always get there, but that's how we try and that's how we roll. That's how we try and roll. It's one of our little things. So hopefully this has helped you. There's lots of things that you can do with your camera. And it doesn't matter if your phone is three years old. It's still probably got a really good camera in there more than enough to be able to take the images that you need for, to do a little bit of marketing. And of course, I always think it's interesting when chefs look at meals that they were cooking four or five years ago, because don't forget that's part of your life as well. So it's great to capture that as well. That's about it. So take some great photos and you go out there and have a really busy week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com